Okay. Well, welcome everybody. It's uh, really great to see so many people signed up for the pro program today, and I hope everybody's staying safe and, and warm. Um, we're not. <laughs> I'm Jane Landers, Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor of History, and I direct the Slave Society's Digital Archive here, the Circum Atlantic Study Seminar, and the Black Atlantic Speakers Seminar at Vanderbilt. And I'm pleased, as I said, to see so many. And it's a great international crowd. I see England and Mexico and Brazil and a wonderful extensive uh, coverage. So thank you for coming. Um, Vanderbilt's Black Atlantic History Lecture Series was launched in 2007 on the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery. And it was with the sponsorship of the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities, who are our hosts today in the Department of History. And over those years, we've enjoyed some really wonderful presentations by the most exciting scholars of Black Atlantic. And today I'm pleased to add to that distinguished list, an old friend and a wonderful scholar of the Black Atlantic, Professor Manuel Barcia Paz. Professor Barcia completed his undergraduate education at the University of Havana and an MA there also. And then he did a second MA and a PhD at the University of Essex. Uh, he began his teaching career there at Essex and went on later to Nottingham, and he's been at Leeds since 20, 2006, I'm sorry. He's the winner of the Philip Leverhulme Prize in History, which is one of the top ones you can get in England, and he's been a fellow at the Hutchins Center Afro-Latin American Institute at Harvard and at Yale's Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. We were just on their, what was it, 25th? anniversary uh, conference at, at Yale. Uh, it, it was focused on Cuban slavery, so I had the pleasure of being with Manuel on that one. And at Leeds, he is the chair of global history. I'm sorry, Essex, he's at Leeds, he's the chair of global history and also the pro dean. What does that mean, Manuel? That's sad, that's sad. You see, it's, it's an interesting thing. This, I'm glad that this is going to be recorded because that, that stays for history. I can show it to people. Okay. Uh, it's associate dean, pretty much. Okay. That's interesting. I'm sorry, I did not know what the that British was. term. He's also served as the editor of Atlantic Studies, Global Stu Global Currents. He's also on the editorial boards of Slavery and Abolition with me too, Cuban Studies and the International Journal of Cuban Studies. And despite all these heavy administrative and editorial duties, he's been amazingly prolific. I'm jealous. And among his wonderful books are the one that he discussed at Yale, The Yellow Demon of Fever, Fighting Disease in the 19th Century Transatlantic Slave Trade, published at Yale, West African Warfare in Bahia and Cuba, Soldier Slaves in the Atlantic World at Oxford, uh, The Great African Slave Revolt of 1825, Cuba and the Fight for Freedom in Matanzas, and Seeds of Insurrection, Domination and Slave Resistance on Cuban Plantations, both of those last two were from LSU Press. And he's currently working on another one, Wage Earning Slaves, Coartacion in 19th Century Cuba with Claudia Varela uh, coming from the University of Florida Press soon, I hope. Is it was it? already published. It's already out. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, I'll have to get that one. The others are on my shelves, but not that one. You want to show it? Oh, great. An azulejo, ne? Came out in December. Oh, great just out. Okay, um, he's also published numerous uh, articles and chapters in English, Spanish, and French in some of the major journals of our field, including Slavery and Abolition, the Americas, the Journal of Caribbean Studies, Atlantic Studies, and the Revista de Indias, among many others. And today, Manuel is going to speak to us on the art of healing African medical practitioners in the 19th century Atlantic world. And I'm grateful that Dr. Daniel Jenkins, Executive Director of the Slave Society's Digital Archive, has agreed to moderate the chat room for us today because I don't think I can handle that. Um, so please send Daniel any of your questions or comments. And with that, I'll turn it over to Manuel, querido. All okay, right, thank you, Jane. Um, right, uh, normally I would, um, if, if this would have been face-to-face, -face, I would have uh, bored you to death with a lecture of 45, 50 minutes. Um, today I'm, I'm actually going to try to, um, to to be more concise and to go more to the point uh, so that we can have a discussion or chat at the end. I'm more than happy to, to talk about whatever you want, including things that are not here. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, 
thank Mary Gray, Terry, Holly, Jane, who is, it's just not only my friend, you know, she's almost like family to me. So it's, it's been a long, long time. And I would like to thank the, the Robert Penn Warren Center for, for the humanities for, for the invitation as well. Um, again, I, I have to reiterate this. I have always wanted to go to Vanderbilt. I consider doing my PhD there and Jane will be able to tell you, uh, but you know, life is, is the way it is. So it's, uh, things not always go the way you, you plan. Today I'm going to be talking about, about stuff that I actually discuss in, in, in my most recent book in the year of Demon of Fever. It's, uh, this talk is pretty much a spin off um, that focus on a very particular aspect. One, one of the aspects that actually led me to write this book. Uh, I, I realized over time that I had a concern with the, 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 the underrepresentation of African uh, health practitioners in, in, the, in, in the history of the transatlantic slave trade. I mean, we are talking here about the 400 years that, that it lasted, or almost 400 years. <clears throat> but me, I have, I have a, a huge, huge um, knowledge gap in anything that, that um, uh, is before the 1789 and after 1870. So if you ask me questions about any period, at, at the two sides of this period are pretty much ignorant. So I, I failed miserably. And I, I try to focus on the period that I know, the, the, the little bit of history where I normally hide away from the present. Uh, so I, I think that historians, sometimes we have two parallel lives, one that we are living right now with all the problems of COVID and all the stuff that is going on. And another one, somewhere for me in 1850 or 1840, where I go and I hide. And the, the, the good thing about hiding in 1840 is that I know how things turn out. Right now I don't. Um, so basically I, I was very concerned with the ways in which African practitioners, Africans in general, have been underrepresented, misrepresented, um, and very often just uh, brushed aside by historians. And I'm not talking about historians in the 19th century, I'm talking about generation on the shoulders of another generation, on the shoulders of another generation of historians. So this was happening until very recently, and still we find enough examples of this kind of, of um, positivist, Whiggish, history of progress um, and in which, of course, the, the white Western man is the one that is leading, leading the, the rest. And um, that's, that's, of course, um, um, kind of a problem. So I basically decided to write this, this um, uh, decided, decided to write on this, this. I decided to write on disease in general. It became very apparent to me that um, there were many things um, that I could sorry, that I could uh, focus on. And the, the interesting part of this story is that I started researching on the history of slavery in the 1990s, mid 1990s. And from the beginning for some cosmic reason that I cannot explain, I started accumulating or taking notes of anything that concerned medical history related to slavery. At the beginning, this was Cuba, then it was Cuba and Brazil, then it was Africa and eventually become something very, very um, circumatlantic in general. And after many, many years doing this, uh, I, I, I came to the conclusion that I had to do something with this information. And, and again, as I said before, one of, of the driving forces behind this decision was precisely my, my frustration with the way Africans have been represented in the, in the literature until now, until very recently. <clears throat> and if, if anybody who knows my work knows that I, I got here via studying African warfare, and, and the one thing that I have been trying to do is precisely to, to try to understand African cosmologies, African transfers of, of knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So this was kind of, of, a, of a serendipitous kind of next step. It just felt right. It was kind of scary, I have to say, um, because I, I am not a medical historian. Uh, um, I don't think I am right now a medical historian. So I'm kind of a neophyte or if at, at best, I'm more like, like an intruder in the field. I'm not sure for how much longer I'm going to be doing things in, in medical history either. But I saw that, um, um, that I had a duty. And then there is, uh, uh, I finished the book, I wrote all I wanted to write and all that. And I have realized that some of the, of the, of the, 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 the train of thoughts that I had when I was writing this book 
um, has become more and more relevant today with, with the COVID epidemic and all that. So for instance, something that, that, um, uh, that I had to deal with, and I'm going to be talking about this in a minute, is how Western, um, uh, Westerners in general, and when I say Westerners, usually Europeans, but there are also Americans here, how they interacted with Africans who knew, uh, who had medical knowledge, how they um, referred to them, how they translated the medical knowledge and how they actually absorbed the medical knowledge as well. But the interesting thing is that if you look at the events of the, of the 19th century, many things that happened back then are still happening today. And I, I found myself actually ranting, which is something that I do very often, um, while um, seeing how, for instance, uh, Western medical doctors today continue to dismiss uh, very often a priori uh, knowledge that is coming from other parts of the world. And I'm thinking, for instance, when, when uh, the Chinese team of uh, doctors mapped the, the DNA of COVID-19 at the beginning of January, at the beginning it was dismissed. When, when the information was coming that, uh, uh, from, from, uh, from Asian countries that using face masks was a logical thing to do, they have been, tra they have been um, uh, trying this for many, many years. Um, it, it also was dismissed until finally we came to terms with the fact that, oh, some Western doctor said, ha, huh, well, you know, maybe we should uh, wear face masks. And six months later, we decided that maybe it was a good idea to wear face masks. So you see, things really, really haven't, the, the, the goalposts that really haven't been uh, moved much. So we are still dealing with the same kind of, um, of um, uh, this feeling of superiority that that it was very very common very frequent in the 19th century so while writing about african practitioners i i've been consciously trying to avoid this narrative of the of the white or western um, medical practitioner health practitioner superhero in his way through africa or, or the atlantic and curing everybody and being you know a worship for bringing i don't know the, the method of inoculation or, or some fetish, as I usually describe. Um, uh, and instead, I have tried to, I, well, I try to focus on the, on the life of ordinary people, um, ordinary um, events that, in one way or another, contribute to a transformation of medical um, uh, cultures in the, in, the, in the transatlantic slave trade in this uh, 19th century, which usually I refer to as the illegal. Um, slave trade because it's actually you know it's happening after a number of um, um, uh, treaties have been signed uh, among different uh, nations to abolish the slave trade. So in that respect, this is kind of a transnational, transimperial approach. Um, so I want to tell you very, very quickly. I'm, I'm not going to get in in, in detailed descriptions, uh, but I'm happy to to discuss this later. You always have Wikipedia, so I'm just telling you. Uh, there are a number of diseases that were the main diseases in the transatlantic slave trade. So smallpox was one of the main um, uh, sources of, of uh, disease and, and, and one of the main killers, but also dysentery. Uh, they had something they call ophthalmia, which is very difficult to pinpoint exactly what it was. Uh, it may have been some kind of trachoma, but the, the, there, is, there are ongoing discussions that uh, we haven't settled yet on anything. And uh, there were mental illnesses, they were, they were quite common, as you can imagine, associated with, with the very process of enslavement and the process of being sent across the Atlantic in the, in the hold of a ship um, in, in infrahuman um, conditions. And there were fevers, and there were many fevers, many types of fevers. Uh, very often they, were, they got mixed up because they had similar symptoms. And um, of course, the treatments that they were implemented to treat these fevers that were um, uh, sometimes plainly wrong. I usually make this joke, which is not a joke really, but um, uh, this, this is a period in which experimentation is actually going to take a central stage and Africa and the transatlantic slave trade, the black Atlantic are going to be like the perfect, um, the perfect setting for this kind of experimentation. So if, if European and American, I mean, historians, medical historians who work this period and, and they work on Europe or the Americas usually refer to this period as the age of heroic medicine. But in the Black Atlantic, it was the age of heroic medicines on steroids. There was no control. There was no, there was nothing here. They, they, were, they were just free to do whatever they wanted. And of course, this allowed for probably a breakthrough or another. But the, 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 the level of, of um, uh, suffering that this, this 
practitioners are going to cause is, is tremendous. Um, I think that it's, it's very clear as well that medical uh, practitioners, Western medical practitioners, they came into contact with, with all these array of diseases and they would have failed miserably to deal with all of them had not been for their interactions with African practitioners. Without their input, without their, their collaboration, without the their knowledge of surgery, the knowledge of, of um, their skills, the, the knowledge of botany, it would have been very difficult to bring um, any of these diseases into, into in, in, within a certain degree of control. Of course, there are, there are diseases in this period for which there are already treatments that sort the work, but it's, it's a very slow process. So basically this, this story that I'm trying to tell to you here is a story of collaboration, a story of, of um, um, giving and, and taking, it's a story of learning from each other, but it's also um, uh, an attempt to bring African knowledge and, and these African practitioners into an analytical framework uh, that considers them as, as crucial um, actors or partners in this struggle against disease and not just as an afterthought uh, or, or, or someone who was not um, there. For me, methodologically speaking, this has been an uphill battle. I cannot, I cannot describe it in any other way. For me, having to, um, to try to read in the sources, to try to find in the historical sources, information about these practitioners was always going, I, I was aware of this, was always going to be a challenge because most of the information that we have is coming from Western practitioners who came into contact with them or, or travelers, not necessarily practitioners, Westerners who came into contact with these Africans and they left um, accounts, uh, medical treaties, et cetera, et cetera, in which they describe what they saw, what they understood. And of course, each and every one of them was a different person with different outlook of the world with a different um, uh, way of understanding what was happening in front of them, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to, to, to tell you that you're probably aware of this, but African, the Africans were perceived as backward, um, uncivilized, heathen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They, they were in need of being civilized and being Christianized. Um, Africa was a dangerous place um, for all those who came into contact with them. Um, and, and interesting enough, we know a lot about the fears, the anxieties that Western travelers and Western practitioners went through when they visited Africa. We know that, for instance, Africa was, uh, many parts of Africa were referred to as the West, uh, as the white man's grave. Um, Africa was considered to be this, this reposit repository of, of um, all kinds of terrible diseases that were mostly deadly or, or debilitating for life. And um, Africans were also referred as, you know, as, as I said before, all these, all these epithets. And we know because of this narrative, what Europeans felt or Westerners felt, how, how their anxieties uh, are going to, to, to boil out when, uh, boil up when, when there is an epidemic, for instance. Uh, and, but we don't know, we know, very, very little about these same fears and the same anxieties when it comes to Africans. We basically know nothing. Even now, I have spent years reading about this and, and the, the, there are bits and bobs of information, but this is really, really minuscule and almost always have to go through the eyes of the Europeans. So let's move on a little bit. I try to look at, at, at African practitioners in three main settings, which made sense at the time because it's where the settings were, um, I, I was interested, um, this is where the settings I was interested in and, and also what most information was for. So first of all, there were um, the slave trade ships and factories which are put together precisely because after 1807, slowly or gradually, the Atlantic, what, what used to be the transatlantic slave trade used to be legal is going to, to become gradually more and more illegal. There are going to be more and more countries that are going to be forced to suppress the, the slave trade. And more and more countries are also going to patrol this. So it's not only that, that countries are signing ag ag agreements with, uh, with Britain, it's that many countries are going to start sending ships to African waters to police the abolition of uh, that the, 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 there is no slave trade. And the French do that. At some point, the French have more ships in Africa that, um, that the British, the Americans are going to have the squadron over there and one in Brazil as well, 
the the Portuguese are going to have a squadron, so they are, they are actually going to to get involved. Uh, and in these slave ships, for instance, that we know for a fact that there were very often Africans born in Africa, but sometimes also Creoles, the Atlantic Creoles that Jane Landis has, has written about, who are going to be <clears throat> acting as as uh, as healers, as practitioners on the slave ships, right? And in the case of Brazil, they even had a name for them, the Sangradores. Um, in, in the factories, in, in, in slave factories in Africa, for which we have less information, there are, there are also uh, reports of Africans, you, you would expect that here it was even more common, Africans who knew different, different methodologies related to medical treatments or therapies, uh, that they were active in, the, in these places. For instance, Theodore Canot, who was one of the most famous slave traders of, of the period, one who left um, a, a very interesting and, and mostly, at least in my opinion, mostly accurate description of what his life as a slave trader was, he, he referred to his people. He refers to, to his skills at, at bloodletting um, and to, to using medical um, uh, medicinal plants to, to treat different diseases. Slave trade ships and factories, however, they were, um, they, they, they were characterized for poor medical facilities, poor medical provision, poor hygiene, and overcrowding. So they were, they were a repository of death. There is no question about that. Another setting I look at is anti-slave trade patrols. Um, here, um, Africans were less represented, but still you can find them. Sometimes when once um, a, a, a slave, a, a, an anti-slave trade patrol has stopped um, a slave trade ship, they are going to board the ship and they are going to bring Africans on board them. Sometimes there are practitioners who are going to share this knowledge with them in, in these uh, environments. Um, these patrol ships are going to be the first lane, la line of containment between the, the legal slave trade and what they call the liberation of Africans. Uh, and they are going to be in a, in a very precarious situation, very good precarious position for um, uh, 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 dealing with, with these diseases. And finally, we have the anti-slave trade reception centers where um, there, there are better medical supplies, there are, the infrastructure is much better, uh, there is more hygiene, there is more, more care uh, paid to hygiene, more investment. But here you really, really see uh, plenty of Africans coming into 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 it and, and being part of of, of the, the, the this this um, uh, corpse medical corpse if you wish within this um, environment. So you have dressers, you have um, um, uh, 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 Africans who are known as doctors, and some of them actually go to Europe and they study in Europe and they come back with medical degrees. And this happened from very early on in the 19th century. Uh, their skills are sometimes recognized by, by the Westerners, sometimes are not, but this is a group that actually sometimes is, is well um, uh, um, referred to by, by Europeans. So let me see what, the, okay, let's, let's move a little bit more. So we have, we have um, a number of exchanges that are gonna take place here and the Africans are going to be at the center of these exchanges. The transfer of knowledge is going to be fundamental for the fight against disease. The pharmacopoeia, the African ph pharmacopoeia, for it, which is a plant that is used to, to treat um, um, African, uh, to, to treat a, a, a snake bites. And in this case, the coaster is very keen to ask all those he meets, all those he come across to, where is this plant coming from? Because every time he sees that the plant is in um, a bottle. And he's always told that they had to keep it in a bottle because they couldn't grow it in, in, in Brazil because his, this plant was being brought from Africa. So this, you, you can see here how this, um, uh, uh, um, these plants are actually going to make it across the Atlantic. And if you know the work of, of Rosomov and, and Carney, actually, you, you will probably be aware that uh, because both the Americas and Africa were part of the same supercontinent until the Jurassic period, the, 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 the Western Pangaea, and they separated very late on, there are many plant genera that are actually families on both sides of the, of the Atlantic. Um, so, botan is going to be central to the story. And um, it's not only the plants per se, right? It's also how the Africans have learned to process these plants, to prepare the medicines that come out from the plants. And yet, 
And yet, still Westerners, um, um, just almost as a sport, are going to um, criticize, they're going to undermine uh, all this knowledge very often. Uh, sometimes they will recognize it, but more often than not, actually what you feel is, is what you see is that there is a strong um, effort to, to undermine. Uh, they use racist epithets, they use condescending epithets, they, use, they call them quacks, they call them witch doctors, you, you men, uh, charlatans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they often mocked um, the way they dance, the way they dress, um, uh, when they are, when they are uh, undertaking the medical rituals. Um, the Landers brothers, for instance, who are going to, to visit Africa in, in the 1830s and 1840s, they are going to call them idle and lazy. They are going to, to show their own prejudice and ignorance, um, uh, referring to them and the medicinal plants as inefficacious and altogether useless. So it's, it's, there is this, this constant narrative. As I said before, it's almost like a sport to refer to this um, uh, to these African practitioners and, and the knowledge as, as useless or, or, or inferior in the best of cases. Um, funny enough, there is a lot of mistrust happening as well. At the same time, there is collaboration and you can map this collaboration. You can see how this, they, they talk to each other constantly. There is also quite a lot of um, mistrust. The Europeans, they complain quite a lot of the Westerners, they complain quite a lot about the Africans not wanting to come to Western practitioners who are supposed to have the state-of-the-art knowledge and instead going to their, to their country doctors. And of course, the Africans sometimes are very wary of um, uh, Europeans' knowledge because let's face it, for most of the diseases of this period, the, the knowledge was pretty much the same. Um, they had different uh, methods, but if you think how Europeans treated fevers, they used mercury, which is, I don't need to tell you, a poison. It kills you. Um, they use bloodletting on top of a mercury, uh, which weakens you. And, and if, because this is obviously, this was obviously not enough, they will give you purgatives as well. And once you were weak enough, if you were lucky to have malaria, they will give you quinine and maybe you will recover if you have malaria. If you have typhoid fever, you will die. So there were, there were um, uh, different levels here of, of um, uh, uh, American knowledge, but but the reality is that it, it, it was still. This is a pre um, uh, epi, uh, pre uh, German theory, German theory period, which means that they were still pretty much uh, guessing as they were. Right. Um, so I I would like to say a couple of things before I close about about the American knowledge and the quality that that these Africans are going to bring to the table. So. Uh, in some cases, they are actually going to to uh, to serve as uh, nurses. This widespread practice in Sierra Leone, for example, they are going to to be called dresses in the in in the in the hospital in Kisi, Kisi, but also in in, in downtown Freetown. And the reason they are going to be picked up is usually because they had already had smallpox. So for those Africans who had already suffered smallpox, it was much easier to deal with the smallpox patients, which was one of the main diseases that would arrive. So they were specifically chosen and trained to act as, as, um, as um, nurses. But you also have doctors, like medical doctors forming Europe and others who have learned the trade in Africa. They have learned from other Africans or they have learned from, from a combination of other Africans and Europeans. There is a very famous case in, in Cape, Cape Coast Castle, uh, a former enslaved African um, who have been there with the Royal African Company, he's going to, to achieve his freedom in 1822, and he's going to remain in the hospital of the castle as the doctor. And he was referred to as Dr. Sawa by everybody. And Europeans who were posted to the Gold Coast would travel long distances to meet him <clears throat> because he was the, the one who had the, the uh, obviously the, the, the most uh, knowledge about the, the diseases and how to treat them. Um, and same, same stories you get from, from uh, places like Santa Elena, and you also get them from uh, practitioners who were in, in other parts of Africa or the Americas who are going to be very willing, very keen on embracing new knowledge. Um, there are many references of Africans who are going to um, embrace vaccination. They are actually going to, to learn the method of vaccination or inoculation, and they are going to implement it. Um, um, uh, 
across their, their, the, the places where they work. And many Europeans are actually going to be um, uh, keen to, to point out this, um, this awareness of African practitioners to not only to, to receive, but also to give, to, to teach them uh, surgical methods to remove the guinea worm or to um, uh, give them uh, therapies to treat a number of, of illnesses from, from sciatica to snake bites. Um, coping, for instance, uh, um, bloodletting. Many Europeans decided to adopt the way that Africans bloodlet uh, because it was, it was less painful and it was faster. So it was very common as well that they would take this knowledge from them. Um, so to conclude, um, I just, I, I want to say again, to close this, and I think we have been about 30, um, that we have African practitioners, every minute of every hour of every day in this period, they are going to be a fixture of this world. You cannot think about how Europeans treated tropical diseases in the slave trade. You have to think about how all practitioners treated these diseases and Africans were central. They were less referred to in the sources. They didn't write down themselves very often what, what they did, but they were there. They were always there. So they were crucial. They were critical. They were, um, without them, um, th this transformation that's going to take place in Atlantic medical cultures would never have taken place. It was this interaction uh, that brought about this, these transformations. They, as I said before, they traded, they share the knowledge willingly without, without charging anybody from it. Um, unlike the Europeans who usually would trade no medical knowledge for um, uh, religious indoctrination, they are not going to be practicing that. They are actually going to give away what they know. and They are going to teach um, uh, Westerners very often um, the, the surgical um, skills um, uh, and the knowledge of, of botany. And even though they were malign and, and dismissed, even though um, occasionally uh, the efforts and, and the persistence uh, were not recorded, because I'm pretty sure that more often than not they were not recorded, um, they were still a core element in the story of this struggle in, in the 19th century slave trade. And I'm going to leave it there. So if, if, <clears throat> if you want to ask questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to have a chat. I see that the, the, the chat is uh, heavy on, on questions and comments, so I'm more than happy to Two um, questions via chat, if you're okay doing it that way, Manuel, um, and yeah, yeah, sure. we can kind of start a conversation like that. Um, I have one already from Ernesto Bassi, um, and Ernesto, I apologize, I'm going to read this as uh, it came to me. Um, so he asked, he, he has to leave for class, um, he asks, in documentation from the 18th century, I find the term um, fiebre putridas, uh, Putrid what fevers. Term? Sorry, what term? Uh, putrid fevers in my very poor yeah, Spanish yeah. pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask <laughs> Manuel to say a little bit about the term. What are they? How are they treated before boarding, on board, afterward? What, what caused them? Um, what did they cause? And where can I read more about uh, these sort of fevers? I'm going to take myself off for one second yeah. to communicate with James. Yeah. Oh man, the, the putrid fevers, this, they are everywhere. Um, so basically, what you get in the 19th century is a combination of different medical schools coming together. So you have on the one side, you have the, the homeo homeopaths who are still saying that if you take this or you take that, you're going to get better. They are still around. You get the people who believe in the, in the theory of the four flu body fluids. So the Greek, uh, um, I think it's uh, Herodotus, who came up, you know, the yellow bile, the, the black bile, blood, and, you know. And then you get the one that was a prevalent, but th again, this is a combination. The one that is a prevalent, prevalent at the time is the miasma or miasma theory. Basically, what this theory says is that um, many of these diseases are the result of putrid, and I'm going to use your word. There are other words, by the way, but putrid emanations from the soil, um, which could be observed, especially in swamps and in places like this, when the sun will hit the swamp, you could see the, the emanations coming out. And they made a direct link between these emanations and fevers. And to a certain extent, they went on to something because if you think which is the place where mosquitoes breed, right? Stagnated water. A swamp is a classic place where stagnated water um, can be found. So there was, there was definitely a link between fevers and 
um, these places. And many of the fevers they are dealing with are being, um, um, are, are being carried out by um, mosquitoes, right? Uh, yellow fever, uh, for example, malaria, they are, they are being um, uh, carried out by mosquitoes. So it, it, there is definitely a link there. Uh, miasma theory is going to dominate during the period. It's going to be until germ theory eventually um, emerges in the 1850s. Uh, it's going to be a little bit longer until it takes over, but um, it's going to be very strong. Uh, and, and most of the medical practitioners of the time are going to, to um, believe that there is um, something about the miasma. So <clears throat> for instance, environments are going to become like, like, like humans. They are going to be like patients. Environments, they need to be attended to, they need to be um, treated and they need to be cured. So how do you cure a, a, a swamp? Well, you dry the swamp. It's really, really very straightforward thing. If you can dry a swamp, and I know that you don't like that phrase over there because it has been used for other reasons in, in, the, in the last few years, but if you dry the swamp, the mosquitoes go away, right? Uh, and therefore there is a reduction of disease. And they figured this out very early on. They also figured out, for instance, and this brings us to today again with COVID, that um, uh, ventilation was very important. Having fresh air was definitely a plus. It, it usually led to, least, to, to less uh, um, uh, disease-ridden environments. Uh, so for instance, they would try to, to, to build houses or, or towns downwind so that, they, uh, um, that there was always a wind blowing. The wind in West Africa, by the way, very often was referred to as the doctor. So it was that um, important to them. I don't know if this answers your question. Ah, by the way, if you want to read about it, read my book. I, I, I wrote quite a lot about it. <laughs> but there are a lot of, of, um, of um, doctors from the 19th century. I can send you the links that later on via Twitter if you want. You know, we are always chatting anywhere over there. Um, that they discuss the, 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 the miasma. It's, it's very, very prevalent at the time. So we've got a couple questions that just came in yeah. um, from Sharifa Balfour and Margaret Bahoni, who are both interested in hearing a little bit more about um, the range of diseases that African practitioners treated, as well as specifically the sorts of materials that they used to treat those diseases. Um, they treated, they, yeah, thanks. They, they treated everything and they, and they dealt with everything because they didn't have an option. Now, there, there, were, there were tropical diseases at the time that they, they had no cure. Um, and the feeling that I get from reading the sources is quite interesting reading, for instance, about um, uh, trypanosomiasis or, or what's the other name for it? Um, uh, I always forget the other name. I used to be the other way around, but it's, it's this uh, disease that is caused by the blue fly, um, sleeping sickness. So they knew that people who would contract a sleeping sickness would die. Period. So at some point they actually give up, and you see European uh, practitioners were arriving in the in, in, in Africa, in West Africa, West Central Africa, in throughout the 19th century. They are trying to tell why why aren't you treating these people? And this, you know, it's nothing we can do here. Um, and this is also pretty much fit quite well with with a romantic period in Europe. It was a disease in which people would fade away. So if you read something like, for instance, the, the way that Lucy. Um, uh, becomes a vampire in Dracula. It's, it's almost a similar process. They are, they are even very, very uh, um, similar descriptions of um, of how people fade away. Tuberculosis, as you know, was very common as well in the period. Um, so they are going to treat everything, but they were particularly skillful with the number of diseases. And and uh, as I said before, they some of them they require surgical skills, uh, surgery, amputation, for instance, uh, European doctors who visit West Africa in the period, they actually come to believe that some Africans are better than them at carrying out amputations. Um, the removal of the guinea worm as well. You also get them to treat, to treat um, stuff like sciatica pains um, with, with the, the sort of massages that the Europeans are not using at that time yet. And there are descriptions of this, of this kind. Um, but they are also they also have remedies. I don't know if they work or not. Although I, I could actually share the, the 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 prescriptions if you want for gonorrhea. Um, they have uh, prescriptions for uh, um, uh, some fevers, which they are going to treat with uh, uh, the, the the brains of of uh, chimpanzees. So there are there are a number of diseases for which they have <clears throat> medical remedies that were more likely than not um, useless. 
but that doesn't make them less important, especially if you compare them with the, the remedies that the Europeans were applying at the time, that they were not just useless, they were lethal. All right, so we, we've had a bunch more in chat. Um, I'm just going to go in the order they were received. And I, I apologize, Mano. Do you prefer to read them or do you want me to actually talk through them? What's the point? No, go, go, go on, go on. I, I just kind of keep up. There are too many. <laughs> okay, great. Um, the next one is from Farron Yero, uh, who's interested in hearing a little bit more about um, smallpox vaccination and any possibilities that I guess that was going on um, in, in the early modern era. Um, yeah, um, this is a discussion that, thank you, thank you, Farron. Um, this is a discussion that I had with, with Catherine and Paul repeatedly over the years. There is evidence that inoculation existed in some parts of West and West Central Africa from much earlier. Um, but there is also evidence from the 19th century that it is new for many. So this, again, this is, and, and this brings us, brings us back to, to, to what sort of sources of doc documents we have for for early modern Africa and even modern Africa, um, there, there is always there are always gaps that we have to try to to interpret and, and to to learn from. And this is a classic case. Here you have a situation in which um, some people knew and some people didn't. And and I really cannot tell you much more than that. What I what I can tell you is that there are reference to them knowing much earlier. And these references are again, Western references, but there are also references to them not knowing at all about it, but always adopting it. I haven't seen a single reference yet of the African saying, no, we don't want to take a vaccine because you know, God knows, you know, it may give me, it may give me, I don't know, some, some kind of syndrome, which is what you get today. That's, that's fascinating news to me for sure. Um, question from Erica Delgado. Um, she has seen the term double head uh, in relation to um, liberated African children from Sierra Leone. And I was wondering if that's a term that you've seen and if so, no. No, I have never seen it, sorry. Sorry, Erica. Nor have I. But I'm, I'm interested now, now you pick my curiosity. <laughs> so please, please uh, drop me a message in Twitter or something because I wanna know more. <laughs> Next from John Gutierrez, um, who's wondering if you have any thoughts on the ways in which uh, African medical practice and knowledge was received and practiced in Cuba during the 19th century. Um, yeah, uh, thanks, John. Um, they, they, it was, as you can imagine, it was received and, and in, until today, people practice um, uh, to a certain extent some of this, of this um, uh, used, this, this kind of knowledge. And um, uh, you're familiar with Palo or with Santeria you know that there are medical uh, medicinal plants there that they are used and they are actually effective. They have been proven to be effective to it with different uh, diseases. And, and if you look at Cuban plantations in the 19th century, which is something I'm, I'm kind of familiar with, again, from the distance, but I am, um, it's, it's, it's common to, to come across. If you're, for instance, you very often when you're working with, with um, court records after the slave revolts, you find this kind of, of reference to some kind of medicinal plant or some kind of poison that they put together from medicinal plants um, to, to get rid of a master. And again, prescriptions about a medicine to, to three different diseases. All these things are um, common. I found this the same for Brazil, by the way. And, um, and, and again, they are also part of, of um, the religious traditions that arrive in Cuba. And, and it's, it's, it's all natural, it's too natural that, that they are going to make it there. But again, you can see Western doctors actually trying to learn from these Africans in Cuba. It's, it's, it's a common occurrence as well. Interesting suggestion from Farron Ree, the, the double head term, um, hydrocephalus. Seems like as reasonable okay. as any to me. Um, question from Carolina Montero. Um, can you talk more about the intersection of indigenous knowledge with African healing practices in 19th century Brazil? Thanks, Carolina. Well, this is my main failure in this book. I wish I could have done more about it. Um, I wish I could know a little bit more about it. Uh, there are obvious um, uh, overlaps here. Uh, there are books written about, about this, by the way. Um, there is a book by Robert Box. Box. It's called Medicinal Plants of Candomblé, if I recall well. 
uh, the book of, of um, uh, there you go. Aha, you see, there it is. Um, uh, Kearney and Rosomov, they treat, they, they discuss this as well. And, and of course, again, it's, it's not very difficult to imagine that there is going to be this sort of, of, um, of, of exchanges. Uh, firstly, because Africans are going to mix very early on with, with indigenous population in, in Brazil and everywhere in America. Second, because as, as Kearney and Rosomov have demonstrated, there is a, 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 a correspondence of plants uh, from both sides of Atlantic. So for, for these Africans, they very often they identify plants. They are very close to the plants that they, they, um, uh, they knew from Africa and they are going to use them. Uh, so to a certain extent, there is, there is correspondence. Then again, there is also, um, especially for Brazil, there are studies, uh, there is, there is a, a, a colleague of mine, Lisa, Lisa Castillo, she has been working on Candomblé and Luis Nicolau, and they have actually found some, some, uh, some information about this kind of exchanges, especially in Candomblé and Terreiros and that, that kind of thing. So it's, it's worth trying. Your race, I think that also mentions this at some point. I don't remember where, but I'm pretty sure your race also mentions it. Uh, he, he found something, right? This is a vague memory. First, could you repeat the name of your book? Because it sounds like there's some interest, Manuel. And then second, a question from Chad, which is to learn a little bit more about um, Africans and Afro-descendants uh, learning medicine in Europe. So this is great. We're kind of going around the Atlantic space. Yeah. Um, this is the title of a book. I think it's going to be easier. People see it, the yellow demon of fever. Um, well, you know, Africans are going to, to make their way to Europe um, from very early on, but to, to study medicine, to learn medicine, and to, um, to bring that knowledge back to Africa, this is something that happens from the late 18th century, not before, as far as I'm aware. Uh, the British are actually pioneering this, so they send a bunch of Africans um, from different parts of Africa, actually, because they have been liberated from slave ships and they have landed in, in Freetown, and they, they send them to, um, I think it's Edinburgh, if I recall well. Uh, and most of them actually finish their, their medical degrees and they go back and they, they practice in, in Freetown. The most famous of them is uh, James Hill, James Africanus Hill, who is going to write books about, about actually is going to write the, probably my favorite 19th century book about um, uh, European imperialism in Africa. Uh, he writes in 1866, 1867. Uh, but then again, the information that we have is once once they come back to to Africa, not while they are in Europe. I don't. I'm not aware of anybody who has actually written much about it. There are a couple of books that I haven't read that came recently, came out recently, about um, Africans in, in in Europe. One of them, by Olivet Hotel, may have some information about this. I'm not sure. I suppose it's what it does. Okay, I'm sure there are questions I missed. Um, if there are questions I missed, please feel free to um, uh, ask them again. And if there are other questions, uh, please, uh, the, the floor is open. So there is one, a new one from Whitney George, um, who asked, considering the limitations of the archive for this subject, can you comment on the motivations of um, European actors for recording African contributions? And, and how do we fill those gaps in the, in the record? It's, it is what it is, you know, it's, it's very difficult. It's, um, it's an uphill battle and you have to be very aware of, of the biases that, that every, every single piece of information you're, you're reading, they have. You have to try to, 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 um, to read the context as well when, when this, um, when this uh, uh, people write, when, what they write, why they write it. Very often, I, 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 for instance, in my case, I have tended to trust them more when they are writing in desperation um, and this is something you can you can actually see sometimes they are they are overwhelmed by dealing with with the disease that may kill them many times so they, they tend to be more forthcoming you feel you, you kind of feel the honesty coming out of them uh, especially when you compare for instance a, a letter they may, may be write in a moment of desperation with the article that they try to publish in a British journal or in a French journal so this this um th there is always a, a bias nonetheless that you have to keep in, in mind while, while reading the sources. I, I don't think there is a, a one size fits all formula. Every, every document has its own peculiarities. Um, every, 
and also has a different background and you can feel sometimes very early on in the narrative even before they have arrived in Africa you can feel that they are already going with a very set idea the Africans are backwards and, and retrogrades and all that they have a very I would say racist uh, clearly racist um, uh, outlook of the world and some others they are not like that some others even though they still consider the Africans sometimes backward and all that they are more open-minded they try to 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 um, to record what they are seeing to to register their own observations and they try to take knowledge from the Africans and they actually write it down sometimes so that is a bit of both there question from Andrew McMichael uh, who's curious to learn more about the role of alcohol in medicine um, and he mentioned specifically uh, everything from African alcohols like palm wine or beer to, to European spirits and how those might have been used. Um, well, they, they, you know, I, I, I know Africans use alcohol, especially you can see this very clearly on the American side of, um, of um, the Atlantic. Uh, but there are several descriptions. And this is not only 19th century, this happened throughout the 400 years of slavery. Europeans describing what happened when they arrived in West Africa, anywhere in West Africa. And they always say, um, the moment you touch land, somebody's selling you either palm wine or they have fermented something. There, there is some kind of uh, our in, in the Portuguese colonies. They have brandy in the, in the, in the French and the British colonies. They always have something to drink. There is always something to drink there. So it's, it's, you, you, if you assume that I, I remember somebody actually who comes out and he said, in every creek your ship goes in, they will sell you palm oil, uh, um, palm, palm wine. So if, if you have this kind of, of um, use of alcohol, widespread use of alcohol, of course uh, you would imagine that alcohol plays a, I, I would say a very important role in any, any medical treatment, say that, especially considering what alcohol does to you um, when you take um, significant amounts of it. Another question here from Erica Garcia, uh, who asks, um, who says that you mentioned that African practitioners rarely wrote down their discoveries or remedies. Um, given that, uh, she asks, what types of historical documents have been most useful to you in, in researching uh, the topic? This is an interesting um, question. Actually, it's, it's a combination. There are medical journals from, from European um, uh, and Western practitioners. Uh, and they are not necessarily medical. They are journals of the, the health practitioners who go to, up to different parts of Africa are going to leave us. Uh, but also any visitor who is recording. And, and then you have quite a lot of correspondence as well. Interesting enough, working with the correspondence of slave dealers was quite revealing. They, they were actually in many ways more honest when they were writing than... than any functionary or any officer working for a government anywhere else. So they were very candid in the way they come. They, you actually read terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. The, you know, uh, to answer the, I think there is a last question there by Susan Prey that yes, I mean, I, I'm reading Dutch these days. So that's, that's as much I can tell you. And I, I, I don't know Dutch. Um, the only way of understanding the, this is by, by going after documents written in every language. They, they, they are so scarce that you need to actually use every every resource available.